So let's start discussing DRAMs. And the D in DRAM stands for dynamic, the same way that the S in SRAM stands for static. And again, dynamic and static here refers to the method of storage. It does not refer to the way data is read from the cells, because all memory arrays are going to read using pre-charged transistors and are going to have high impedance nodes while reading. So what we mean here is that storage, the storage mechanism itself, is dynamic, meaning that we rely on high impedance capacitive nodes to store values, meaning that we are opening ourselves up to the effects of leakage and charge sharing and um, all the uh, signal integrity issues that we discussed in uh, dynamic CMOS logic. In fact, these effects have a much more detrimental uh, uh, impact on DRAMs than they do on dynamic latches, registers, or random dynamic CMOS logic. So the word, uh, the, the main thing about DRAMs is their density. Uh, DRAMs are about mass storage in a small area. They are RAMs, meaning that they are read-write memories. They allow fast, you know, um, relatively fast writing, and they should allow relatively fast reading. We will see that DRAMs are really slow when compared to SRAMs, which is why they have to justify their existence. They are pretty slow, uh, but they offer us the highest density of storage, the most bits per unit area, if writing speed is something that you care about. Uh, NAND flash ROMs kind of compete with DRAMs in terms of density, but NAND flash has issues both with read speed and specifically with writing speed because programming um, uh, double gate transistors is very different from writing in RAMs. So again, the, the thing here is that we are going to give up a lot of the speed that we enjoy with SRAMs in return for high storage density, which is why DRAMs are um, the method of storage of choice for the majority of main memory on microprocessors. And this is the main use for DRAMs, to create mass storage, mass, uh, you know, active storage for uh, microprocessors, forming the main memory. Whereas SRAMs uh, form on-chip caches, which contain uh, really important information that is fetched ahead of time from DRAMs. Uh, anyone familiar with uh, computer systems will understand how uh, having a large cache memory is going to improve the performance of the processor, um, even more so than having a lot of main memory. But you also understand that having a lot of main memory is important. So let's start discussing specific DRAM arrays. And the simplest DRAM cell that we can make is uh, the four transistor DRAM cell, which is formed by uh, taking an SRAM cell and removing the PMOS transistors. So this is what you see here exactly. Uh, we have removed transistors M2 and M4 from the SRAM cell, and we are left with these four transistors, which are the NMOS transistors of the, uh, of the two S uh, static uh, inverters, as well as the two axis uh, transistors M5 and M6. Now, let's think about how this cell can store values and how we can read from it and write to it, because this is what we care, care most about when we see a new memory. So uh, let's just imagine that um, we want to store a 1 at node Q. So node Q is going to be at VDD, which causes nodes, node uh, Q bar to be 0 volt. Now, uh, imagine that the access transistors are off. Uh, the question is, will this cell keep its state? And the answer is yes, because uh, Q is VDD, which turns M3 on, causing Q bar to uh, remain at 0 volt. Because Q bar is at 0 volt, then M1 is going to be cut off, which allows node Q to keep the value of VDD. But notice that now node Q is storing the value dynamically. This is a high impedance node storing VDD in a dynamic high impedance node because M1 is cut off, M5 is cut off, and we observe a zero volt coming from the other cell. Uh, Q bar in this case is a low impedance node uh, connected to ground. Now, this is a DRAM because one of the nodes here is storing value dynamically. If we want to read from this 
cell, what we're going to do is we're going to pre-charge the bit line, bit line bar to VDD. We cannot actually pre-charge to VDD over 2 in this case. We pre-charge to VDD and then um, we observe which side starts to discharge. So if we pre-charge to VDD and enable M5 and M6, then bitline bar is going to discharge through M6 and M3, while uh, bitline is not going to discharge because uh, Q is also at VDD, and therefore uh, Q and bitline are at the same voltage, and M5 is essentially uh, cut off. So we observe which side drops in, which side doesn't, and we can determine uh, where the one was being stored. Now, uh, writing to the cell is also fairly easy. Uh, all we have to do is drive the correct values on bitline and bitline uh, bar, the values you want to write on bitline and bitline bar, and then enable M5 and M6, which is basically the same way uh, we did it for SRAM cells. Now, um, this obviously has less uh, area than an SRAM cell because it has two fewer transistors. Uh, it also has two fewer PMOS transistors, which helps a lot but it's not significantly smaller and there's obviously something off about it because you know we have like a redundancy here uh, why are we storing in node q and node q bar why is one node low impedance when the value is already stored on the capacitor at, at, at the high impedance node q and this observation basically leads us to the conclusion that one of the transistors m1 and m3 is redundant and we should get rid of it, which leads to the three transistor DRAM cell. Uh, and here the DRAM cell consists of M5, M3, and M6. So this is a practical DRAM cell. The four transistor DRAM cell is just a conceptual idea, but this is a practical DRAM cell which has some specialty applications. Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a, a great improvement over SRAM because it essentially has half, half of the area. And it has some other disadvantages, uh, has some other advantages too. Now notice that the two access transistors, M5 and M6, now have separate controls. So we have something called WE, which stands for write enable, and something called RE, which stands for read enable, which means that we are reading through M6 and writing through M5. Now bitline, bitline bar are also not going to be complements of each other. They're not working differentially. Instead, one of them is going to be the write line, while the other is going to be the read, read line. So we're going to write through uh, one side and read through the other side. And this actually helps a lot with understanding how this cell works uh, because it, it really cleans up the whole thing. So let's think about how we can write into this cell first. And let's think about conceptually where storage takes place. So if you want to write a uh, one, basically, or a VDD, uh, you're going to drive the write line to a, a value of VDD, and then you're going to uh, enable the word enable line. So you're going to raise word enable to one, which turns on M5. Now this causes uh, the capacitance at the storage node to charge up to VDD, and then we lower word enable. When we lower word enable, this storage node becomes a high impedance node because it observes the cutoff transistor through M5 and the MOSFET gate through M3. So it will keep, at least to a first order, it will keep the value of VDD and will store it, you know, conceptually forever. Now, this value of VDD at the storage node is going to guarantee that M3 is on and it's always on. So M3 is now going to be always on. So if you, if you want to read, you can pre-charge the read line. Um, you can pre-charge it actually to VDD or VDD over 2, but we are pre-charging it to VDD in this case. So we pre-charge the read line to uh, VDD. And then we enable uh, the uh, read access transistor M6 by raising read enable to 1, right? So we, ra we raise read enable to 1, and now the VDD on this read line is going to discharge through M6 and M3 because M6 is on, because read enable is on, and M3 is on because there's a VDD stored here. And so we are going to read a zero volt. So when you wrote a VDD on the storage node, you read a zero volt from the read line. So there's kind of an inversion happening here, but that's okay. Now, if you on the other hand, store a zero volt on the storage node, then the transistor M3 is always going to be off. 
Now, what's going to happen is when you pre-charge the bit line and enable read enable, M3 is going to be cut off and therefore the read line is not going to be able to discharge and it will remain at VDD. So storing a zero volt allows us to read a VDD, which means that we can store a value and read it, uh, which is basically memory. Now, this is solidly a DRAM because, uh, because uh, storage takes place on the capacitance of a high impedance node. Notice that this capacitance, this storage capacitance is uh, almost always just the parasitic capacitance of the drain of M5 and the gate of M3. So we just rely on the parasitic capacitance of these two guys to provide the storage capacitor here. Uh, this is important to note because this is in absolute contradiction to the one transistor DRAM cell, which requires a specialized storage capacitor. Now, uh, the I just mentioned that there's something called the one transistor DRAM cell, which obviously tells us that there is a much smaller DRAM cell than this one, uh, which uh, begs the question, why even bother to use a three transistor DRAM? Well, it has some applications because it has some advantages. First of all, as I said, it doesn't need a, uh, an explicit capacitor for storage. It just uses the parasitic capacitance of the node, of whatever node uh, it, it happens to use. Uh, it also has a distinct advantage that you can see only when you look at its layout. This is the layout of the th three transistor DRAM cell. And the point here is that we are not using any weird uh, processing steps. We are not using layers that we didn't see in standard CMOS. So in fact, you can create three transistor DRAM arrays using standard CMOS, which allows us to use them as embedded memories on chip with, uh, with our systems. Uh, do we do that though? Uh, the, the thing is, when you have embedded memories, they usually happen to be SRAMs. This allows you to not think too much about uh, issues of leakage or charge sharing or any of these other issues that happen with dynamic circuits and just focus on reading and writing and, you know, um, on the whole, on the high level architectural view of the system. So do we actually have a lot of embedded DRAMs? No. When you use DRAM, you tend to use it off chip as main memory. And in that case, you might as well use a one transistor DRAM cell. Uh, 